Hi, this is Dawn from Prairie Creek Seed, along with Kelly from the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. We've reached our afternoon portion of the virtual field day. Thanks for tuning in. We've already covered soil health and perennial pastures. Now we'll head back to the field to hear from Amanda with Prairie Creek Seed about cover crops. Hi everyone, this is Amanda Rollins with Prairie Creek Seed. And I'm Jamie Labatt. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon <clears throat> again. We are out in Jamie's oats and clover stand. So we'll start off, tell us a little bit about this, what this field was last year. Last year, this field was preventive plant acres. Uh, tried to put a cover crop in, it really didn't work very good with sure. the moisture and the weeds, so. Okay, yeah, and then tell us kind of what you did this spring right away. This spring, when it dried up, I uh, no-tilled into the cover or the, the stubble with a conventional press drill. I put in about three bushels of oats, about six pounds of medium red clover, and I ended up treating it uh, a little bit later with a broadleaf herbicide. Otherwise, it grew well and the oats is harvested now. Um, the test weight was a little lighter than I'd like, but other, all in all, I was pretty happy with how it went. Good. Yeah, so the main goals was using the oats as a cash crop, getting the straw, and then having the clover there as a cover crop for this fall and yeah. the next spring. Yes, I took, uh, took a little bit of straw off of some of it and blew some back on sure. and Yes, hoping for some good nitrogen for the corn crop next year. Okay. Yeah, so we've actually taken some pictures and videos ahead of time so that you guys can see this a little closer up and what it looked like at the beginning of the month. So we'll go ahead and switch to that now. Photos kind of shows you what it looked like July 1st. So Jamie, you just want to give us some of the specifics again? Yeah, drilled it in the 21st of April with the three bushes of oats and the <clears throat> six pounds of medium red clover, excuse me. This is just another close up here, kind of the clover that you had established of, under the oats. Were you pretty happy with the clover stain that you got? Yes, I was actually very happy with the stand of the clover. I chose a little shorter oats variety, which was better rated for interseeding and it worked out well. So kind of focusing on the oats here, what was your purpose of putting them in? How did you harvest the grain and where did it go? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to diverse, diversify the crop situation a little bit more and another cash crop with small grain options. So I ended up contracting the oats through grain millers with the Oatly program, which also <clears throat> is part of the cover crop interseeding. I windrowed the, the oats last week and we just harvest finished harvesting them the, the evening before last, so. Okay, do you wanna tell us a little bit about the equipment that you used to harvest the oats? I used uh, just a uh, windrow swather, let them dry a few days, and then I come back with my conventional combine and a pickup head and, and harvested them. Sure. Um, yeah, and you definitely left some residue out here of the oats, which is good, so you're able to utilize some of the straw and then still leave a good residue here with the clover throughout the spring. So we got a question coming in. What made you choose red clover? That was one of one of the options with the, the Oatly program. Um, and I, I, I like the fact that it, it's a pretty fast growing and can reduce the nitrogen. And also it's a grazing option for the cattle. Sure. Yeah, I think oats, oats and red clover together is a pretty dependable practice as it establishes pretty well and reliably, so. All right, so then here we're looking again a little closely at what the clover looked like underneath the oats back at the beginning of the month. Um, and like we've said, this main goal of this legume was to fix some nitrogen through this fall and overwinter and come up next spring. And then uh, you'll be terminating that. And we've kind of seen as a full season overwintered cover crop, red clover can fix 70 to 150 pounds of nitrogen. So. That sounds pretty good for your corn next year, doesn't yes, it? Yes, I'm excited to see, hopefully do some soil tests in the spring to see where we're at. Sure. All right, so then this video here is actually showing everyone exactly what we're standing on today. So compared to the other videos, this was taken just here today and we can see exactly this, this thick carpet of red clover that you have that will
me through the fall and come up next spring for you. What challenges or what things would you have liked to change on this if you could? One of the challenges of this spring, it was so cold early, I didn't get a chance to burn down the grass when I, before I planted, before I drilled the oats. So that was a little bit of a struggle uh, with you know, a little extra grass pressure and weed pressure. But all in all, I think it went fairly well. The summer heat didn't cooperate during seed filling time. So I sure. think that's where the test weight suffered, but. Overall, this is something you, you use in your rotation again? Yes, I'm, I'm gonna plan on keep doing this. It's sure. looking very nice so far, so. Good. Okay, well, now that we've looked kind of specifically at this field, we wanna give some more information on cover crops for this fall, some specifics of what to plant and really how to prepare your fields for this fall, winter, and even into next spring. So we'll go ahead and switch to that now. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Amanda Rollins with Prairie Creek Seed and this presentation is going to go into a little more details on cover crops and how to use them this fall to prepare for winter. The first group of cover crops we want to touch on is grasses. So these can be split up into cool season or warm season with cool season being things like oats, barley, cereal rye, annual rye grass. And on the warm season side, it would be things like sorghum sedan, sedan grass, millet. Most grasses have a fibrous root system, which as a cover crop does a lot to condition the soil by relieving compaction and also providing erosion control with that really dense root system. Grasses are also really great nitrogen scavengers, and they also are really good at pulling up other nutrients and holding them in their plant tissues. So as a cover crop, grasses are able to pull up nutrients, hold them in the tissues, and then as that cover crop is terminated, it's able to release those nutrients back into the soil. The next group of cover crop is legumes, and legumes really increase the diversity of a blend. We like to use them in a mix with grasses and brassicas. And legumes are also known for their nitrogen fixing abilities through nodules, which you can see in this picture here. So the image below kind of shows how that happens. And one important thing to note about legumes is that when they fix nitrogen, they don't make it available that same year. The nitrogen is pulled up into the plant and then that plant has to break down and become inorganic nitrogen that is able to be taken up by the following crop. So that's just something to think about when planting legumes in a cover crop rotation. The next group of cover crops is brassicas and these come in a wide range of forms most common ones being rapeseed, turnip, radish. And a lot of these are known for their deep tap root. They do provide some compaction relief in that immediate root area where it breaks up the soil. Brassicas are also really good nutrient scavengers. So that's something that shouldn't be overlooked. They're able to take up nutrients when they're green and growing like the picture on the left. And then as they break down throughout the winter, they end up looking like the picture on the right and they release those nutrients really well and provide a really good soil condition to plant into in the spring. Next, I want to talk a little bit about carbon to nitrogen ratios. You've probably heard a lot about this if you've read or listened to other videos on cover crops. So you can see here the estimated carbon to nitrogen ratio of those different families of cover crops. And those all really depend on the growth stage of those types of cover crops. What I want to focus on is the length of time for residue breakdown, that's really how I look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio and think about that. So legumes break down really quickly. And in this image here, you actually can't even see any residue of legumes that were in that mix the previous spring because they break down so fast. And then brassicas will take the next longest to break down. So as you can see in this image here, there still isn't much left to that brassica as it broke down throughout the winter and released all of its nutrients. And then young grasses, like the oats and barley pictured here that would have winter killed in this mix, they take longer to break down than legumes and brassicas. And you can see that there's still some residue there of those grasses. And then mature grasses, which would be like these corn stalks in the image here, take the longest to break down as they're the most lignified. So that's why there's still a pretty good chunk of residue seen in this image from the spring. 
Switching gears here a little bit into specific mixes for cover crops this fall, as we move into August, September, it's gonna be time that you'll be putting some cover crops in after summer harvest. So early August to mid-September examples of some of these cool season mixes would be like our forage max, for example, which can work really well to condition the soil and also provide forage if that's something you're looking for in a cover crop. Nutrisaver and AgriVantage can go a little further into the fall and provide nutrient scavenging as well as erosion control from the grasses and the blends. If it gets past that mid-September timeframe here in the Midwest, we switch mostly to just the winter wheat, winter triticale, and cereal rye as your cover crop options. So the differences between the two, we look at the fall planting date. So winter wheat does have the earliest cutoff date for planting in the fall. Winter triticale would be also a little earlier based on where you're at in the Midwest. And cereal rye is really flexible and can be planted the latest, basically up until the ground freezes. And then moving on to the spring maturity, winter wheat will be the latest to mature, triticale will be kind of mid-maturity, and then cereal rye is always going to be the first to green up and get going and also be first to harvest in the spring. Quality-wise, from what we've seen, the winter triticale is going to be the highest quality generally, followed by winter wheat. And then cereal rye is listed as third quality, but it still does make good quality forage when harvested at the correct time. Another option for this late fall time frame would be hybrid rye. So compared to VNS cereal rye, the hybrid rye is going to have higher yields, improved quality, and increased tillering. It does have an earlier planting deadline, so that's something to think about depending on when you're going to be able to get this in in the fall. In the spring, it will mature earlier than triticale, so that's something to think about when it comes to your cover crop termination time in the spring or your forage harvest time if you're going to be using it as a forage. Moving back from the fall a little bit here into some of the things that you might have planted this summer. So some summer annual mixes similar to our summer blend are probably up and growing right now and you're watching them soak up the sun. And it doesn't look quite like the picture down below yet, but when it does, that can be a really good time to graze some of those summer annuals. So in the image down there, you can see the grasses are all frosted out, but are maintaining their structure in the blend. And then if you see tinges of green throughout that picture, that is the forage brassicas in the mix. So they hold their quality into the winter so that livestock can get a good balance of feed with the high protein brassicas balanced with the digestible fiber of those summer annual grasses in the blend. As you're going to start grazing those warm seasons this fall, when they do frost off, you may have concern of prussic acid. And that's something that can build up in the warm seasons after that hard frost. It can definitely be taken care of based on the way that you manage it. So if you're grazing the winter annuals and a hard frost occurs, you just need to remove the livestock for 10 to 12 days. That prussic acid will dissipate and you can put the livestock back on to continue your grazing rotation. If you're harvesting those forages after a hard frost, they can be harvested at any time, but store those for 30 to 40 days again, for that prussic acid to dissipate, and then the feed will be safe. You can also send it in for a prussic acid analysis if you want to just be really sure on that. I want to wrap up here kind of just talking about cover crops being used as soil builders versus using cover crops as forages. Cover crops not harvested and left to just go back into the soil, we kind of call that a soil building year. So that really recycles the residue for those microbes in the soil, kind of feeding your underground livestock. And then if you are to graze cover crops, those nutrients still get recycled back into the soil. They just move through your animal first and provide forage. If you're harvesting cover crops as a forage, it can provide really great stored feed, but that does remove the above ground growth of that cover crop. So any nutrients that that cover crop took up, it does remove but there is still the below ground benefit of those cover crop roots being in the ground. Thank you for taking a look at this. If you have, if you have any other questions, feel free to follow up, whether it's a call or an email, we're available at any of these locations.